Horace Walpole, a prolific English writer, was the chief chronicler of mid-18th century life and manners in England. Wilmarth Sheldon Lewis, 20th century American scholar and collector, is editor of the Yale edition of Horace Walpole's Correspondence. These two men are the subject of the following film portrait on Yale 77. goes back to 1923 when I found at York in England 32 pages of notes on 18th century characters by Lady Louisa Stewart, the daughter of Lord Bute, George III's Prime Minister. Her notes led me to Horace Walpole and the next year in London I bought six of his letters. They were so delightful I read all 17 volumes of his letters, then in print. A year later, I got several pieces printed at his private press in the mid-18th century, and set out to make the greatest collection of him in existence. This was the valor of ignorance, but it turned out all right. And when I came, to read them. I was fascinated by one in particular, which was so uh, witty, it was so candid, and it was doing that, that really channeled me, my interest in Horace Walpole. I became hooked. This was the man I really wanted to collect. When one day at Scribner's in New York, I hesitated whether I should uh, get it or not, and told my brother, who was on from San Francisco, a good deal older than me, about this, and he said he hoped very much, uh, that I wouldn't do this, but it sounded all very expensive. So after lunch, I went right back to Scribner's and got the lot, and that was the beginning of my Walpole collection. I think what appealed to me most, what struck me most, was his personality. I liked him. He was a tremendously good friend. He was very amusing. He was very entertaining. He knew everybody and went everywhere. He was a great figure as the son of the great prime minister, Sir Robert Walpole. He was an outstanding figure, even as a young man. And anything that he touched, he adorned. This, of course, uh, gave me a sense of comradeship with this man. I had many similar tastes. He was a collector. I was a collector. He was on a vast scale. I was just a Buster Lewis starting out uh, very modestly. But, uh, and he loved to write, he loved to read, and he loved his friends. And I found him 
uh, an extremely companionable human person. I was also drawn to him by the fact that he had been mercilessly handled by Macaulay in 1833. Macaulay reviewed the first published letters to Horace Mann. It was very brilliant caricature. It had enormous effect on Walpole's reputation for a century. Of course, I began uh, discovering uh, people who had stood up for him. Lord Byron, for example, admired him extraordinarily. He said, some 13 years before Macaulay, and he's more important writer than anybody living today, be he who he may, Coleridge uh, and himself. He had a, a relatively uneventful life. He never married. He was in Parliament for 26 years. And his main interests in life were his house, Strawberry Hill, which is extremely important in the history of the Gothic revival and architecture. That was one of his two major interests. The other major interest was transmitting to posterity, to us, a true and full, accurate, entertaining history of his own time. In his memoirs, he's continually addressing posterity. He will identify himself, and if he wrote his name in enough places, uh, it would reach posterity. He was thinking of, of people like himself living in posterity. He thought particularly in the 20th century. The next Augustan age, he wrote in 75, will dawn on the other side of the Atlantic. There will be a Thucydides, Boston, a Xenophon in New York, a Virgil in Mexico, and a Newton in Peru. And uh, he was extraordinarily prescient about the future. He knew that we would uh, produce marvels uh, which are inconceivable uh, to the 18th century. He would rejoice over the liberation of the slaves and would be profoundly impressed by our scientific and technological advances which he anticipated delightfully in his letters. Fortunately, in the beginning, I realized that it was very important for me to get uh, books that he owned, his library. After all, you learn a great deal about a man from the books that he uh, collected and owned and read. In the case of Walpole, they were particularly important because he annotated his books very fully. It wasn't a big library, it had only about 6,500 titles. But of the 3,000 odd that uh, now uh, at Farmington, I was able to get uh, them at a rate, especially during the 30s, a uh, rate of four or five every day. And <clears throat> now I'm lucky if I get four or five a year. These are the books that Walpole printed at his private press at Strawberry Hill. He started it in 1757 with Odes of Grey, his great friend and went on for 32 years to 89 when he ended with a poem by Hannah Moore. This is Walpole's journal of it, beginning in 57, going to 89, telling the number of 
what books he printed, the number, and when. He did comparatively few copies of each. And I set out to get 10% of them. That is to say, where he printed 100 copies of a book, I set out to get 10. Why should one get so many? Well, the answer is that he changed the book as he went along. He was very fond of his press, it was on his place, and he would go to see what the printer was printing. And he would perhaps uh, be dismayed by what he saw, and he would say, oh, well, I can't have that, and he would write a new page there, creating what bibliographers call a variant. Now, there are many of these. Up above is a list of the public and semi-public institutions, 28 of them in this country, four abroad, that have given or exchanged unique uh, Walt Pollyanna with uh, me. The College of St. Mark and St. John, a small college in London. A reader there discovered a letter of Walpole's laid away in a book in a stack, took it to the librarian who said that this ought to be at Farmington and got his trustees to give it to me. Our print room was converted from a squash court when I realized we should be making more use of political and personal caricatures in the L edition of Horace Walpole's correspondence. The caricaturists were the photographers of the town, showing rooms and people as they were, and thousands of details of everyday life. My wife began the cataloging of this print collection and worked on it for five years before she died in 1959. Since then, we have been very fortunate in having skilled people continue her work. These are the cards that cover um, English satires uh, in the 18th century. Each print has at least six cards. Chronological, title, persons, printer and publisher, artist and engraver, and subject. Some prints have 30 or 40 cards. The subject cards are around here. There's nothing like these cards, I may say, uh, anywhere else on the planet. The British Museum, for example, which has been the great historic collection of them, and produced the catalog uh, personal and political satires, which is the standard upon which all this work has rested, uh, hasn't a single cross-reference card. And we have over 60,000. Did curtains in this country in the 18th century come down onto the floor? They didn't touch the floor in England, they didn't in this country, because we followed English fashion. <laughs>
say one in the whole library would undoubtedly be the original drawings for Strawberry Hill. Uh, these drawings, you say, are of the greatest importance. Walpole kept them. They were made by a man named Richard Bentley, who lived with Walpole off and on um, for uh, some 10 years. This needlework portrait of Strawberry Hill was copied by my wife from a watercolor drawing of Strawberry that I got one summer in London. It was the first needlework she ever did. And she was spurred on by the fact that her family was famous for their needleworkers, who had rather looked down on her because uh, she wasn't uh, uh, in their class. Actually, I think uh, the result is quite as good as anything any of them ever did. In September of, of 32, when my wife and I uh, got to London, I hurried around, as usual, to Mag's brothers, who were my agents. On that, the day I got there, on September 32, Mr. Ernest Maggs, who was the member of the firm who looked after me, said, I'm sorry, we haven't anything for you this time. Well, I was astounded. No, he said, I'm afraid nothing at all, and he was quite ready to have me go. But I sat there stunned with disappointment. And then I had an inspiration. There's no other word for it. This came from on high. And I said, you know, it's just occurred to me that I ought to have an example of Walpole's hand every year of his life. Oh, well, said Mr. Uh, Max, and ordered up 40 letters of Walpole that the firm had had for 11 years and hadn't been able to sell, although they'd offered them over and over again in their catalogue. But I uh, didn't buy, during that interval, uh, his letters, unless they were unpublished. And when, feeling rather impertinent to do, do so, I, I collated them with the Toynbee text, I found to my astonishment that there were a great many errors of transcription. These were errors of um, proper names, dates. The earlier 19th century uh, editors cut out passages that they thought would be wounding to the families of the correspondents. And they also cut out passages that they thought were un improper. As a Yale graduate who was planning to leave his collection to Yale, I naturally turned to the Yale University Press as the publisher of the Walpole Correspondence. There were three reasons for making the new edition. The first was to include the letters to Walpole few of which had been printed. The second reason was to supply the explanation of the letters, the, uh, to know what they're talking about. Um, <clears throat> the faulty text was the third reason for doing the whole business over. The four main interests that appear most largely in his correspondence from 36 to 97 when he died were politics, 
society, by which I mean uh, the, the life of uh, his uh, friends, and uh, literature and the arts and antiquarianism. But there is no subject in the 18th century uh, which doesn't appear. I once said this to in a talk. I said, you find every subject in Walpole, except, and I stopped to think of an absurd exception. And I said, beekeeping. And the very next unpublished letter I got of his was all about beekeeping. Walpole invented the word serendipity in a letter to Sir Horace Mann to describe finding something of value while looking for something else. It comes from a book, The Three Princes of Serendip, who were continually making such discoveries. It was revived when penicillin was discovered while looking for something else. I had a fantasy uh, about a year ago of the Almighty calling me into his office, I think he does quite frequently, and uh, telling me that bad news for me this morning, he was going to destroy every object in my house except one that I could save. And he'd give me 20 minutes to uh, pick it out. And I said, well, Lord, you don't have to give me 20 seconds. I'll take Bentley's designs, the strawberry hill. He nodded approval. And then he said, for that, you may save two dozen more. And after a pause, uh, he said, I know you're not very good at arithmetic. But what I'm telling you, and this was in a louder voice, is you may save 24 plus 1 equals 25 objects. I don't care what they are. Books, manuscripts, pictures, prints, anything you like. Well, and so I said, I'm afraid I'll need more time. Ask how much time I want. And I said, a year. And in a terrible voice, he said, a year. And I said, sir, you see, I not only have to pick them out, but I want to write them up as I go along. And that's the end of the fantasy and the book, beginning of the book I'm calling Collector's Choice. One of my closest old English friends, R. W. Chapman of Oxford, who is a great 18th century scholar, used to come to visit us every other year. And on one of these occasions, he said to me in his Danish way, in the English 18th century, Yale is first and the rest, nowhere. And that was 40 years ago. On my desk, this library will be Yale and Farmington, where scholars and students will come to work on every aspect of the 18th century. of 80, halfway to 160, I am enjoying the library more than ever. Publication of the Yale Walpole is a continuing effort at Yale University carried out by a professional staff. John Riley is associate research editor, currently working on Walpole's miscellaneous correspondence, which is the subject of the final three volumes in the edition. The primary purpose of Wilmarth Lewis's 
great collection of Walpoliana and 18th century English materials has been to establish and enrich the Yale edition of Horace Walpole's correspondence. The actual editing of the correspondence began in July 1933 in room 331B of the Sterling Library at Yale. Now, some 44 years and 39 volumes later, a small group of editors occupies the same cluttered office as the Walpole edition nears completion. At the beginning, Mr. Lewis had the services of one full-time research editor, Dale Wallace. He was soon afterwards joined by Warren Smith and later by George Lom, both of whom decided to devote their professional careers to the edition. Ever since then, four or five editors have worked together at one time under Mr. Lewis's direction. The first two volumes in the series came out in 1937. We expect to publish volume 48, the last, about 1980. Julian Boyd, the editor-in-chief of the papers of Thomas Jefferson at Princeton, once called the Yale Walpole the grandfather of the great scholarly editions of a man's papers or correspondence. Lyman Butterfield of the Adams Papers described the enterprise simply as editing on the grand scale. Our job as editors is to produce a scrupulously accurate text of the correspondence, along with extensive notes which identify the people and explain the subject matter in the text. The annotation is the heart of our work, requiring constant access to the unique material in the Lewis collection and to the books of a large research library such as Yale's, which is particularly strong in its 18th century holdings. Within the profession, editorial projects such as ours are jokingly known as factories, the Walpole factory, the Boswell factory, and so on. But there's nothing at all mechanical about the operation. Year in, year out, it's slow, painstaking work with no shortcuts along the way to a completed volume. But the scholarship must be meticulous if it's to stand the test of time, and we hope that ours will survive to illuminate Walpole and his age for generations to come. <laughs>